What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Pro GK Podcast. My name is Omar Zini, and I'm going to be your host once again. Uh, in today's episode, I'll be answering a frequently asked question, how do I bounce back from a mistake? And the reason why I chose this topic was because I felt that like it was something that all of us goalkeepers could relate to. I mean, we've all been there before. Everything is going well. We're full of confidence and belief in ourselves and in our game. When all of a sudden there's a lapse of judgment or a lapse of concentration, and that leads to a goal. And in what may only seem like a matter of seconds, all of that belief is gone. Your teammates are turning on you, your coaches are looking at you differently, and worst of all, you've lost confidence in yourself. Now, instead of your decision making being based off of instinct, it's coming from a place of fear. You know, you stop communicating with your team, you become hesitant, and now you're leaving yourself susceptible to a second error. But like I've said in previous episodes, it's important to be proactive versus reactive so that situations like these don't end up crippling us and compounding into a string of errors back to back to back. So when discussing this topic, it's key to remember that none of us are perfect. We're all due for a mistake or two now and again, and it's absolutely crucial that we have a strong foundation. And that foundation should be capable of withstanding an error or at worst, a costly one that decides a game. So my goal of this episode is to give you guys the tips and tools to construct that foundation of confidence. This is a must to get ahead of the inevitable of that mistake. And just as important as it is to have a way to combat your nerves, you must also have a way to combat that adversity in those crucial moments. So in this episode, I'm going to be covering these three instances. The first is, what do you do in a game after you've just made a mistake? The second is, what do you do post-game? And the last is, what do you do if those errors end up costing you your starting job? And while a lot of your guys' situations may vary from case to case, you know the information in this episode should serve as a general guideline of what to do when facing those confidence issues from an error. And it's important that you guys are able to you know, internalize this information and rationalize with it and use it to begin structuring your own foundation of confidence. All right, guys, with that all being said, let's get into the episode. All right, man, so shouts. Let's get it. So to start, I want to try and paint a picture for you guys. Just imagine it's the 60th minute and your team is playing against one of your biggest rivals. It's a high stakes game, there's a lot of people there, and there's a lot on the table. The opposing team gets a free kick 30 yards out on the right touchline. You're setting up your wall and getting ready for a right footed in swinging service. You bark out your last orders to your wall and move into your starting position. The ref blows the whistle and then the ball is served. As soon as you see the ball leave the striker's foot, you realize that it's a ball that you can come and claim. You scream keeper, and you start your approach to the ball. It's a routine cross, so right away you're already thinking about a counterattack. You start your jump, you go up and collect it, but you don't watch it all the way in. On your way down, the ball begins to slip out of your grasp, and you lose it in the mix of people. You go to claim it on a second attempt, but it's already too late. Their poaching forward, who has been taught to finish every cross by reacting to any drops from the goalkeeper, is already there. He capitalizes on the mistake, and he taps the ball into an empty net. You get up, you take that lonely walk to pull the ball out of the net, and to add insult to injury, you're forced to watch the opposing team celebrate behind your goal. You look up, none of your teammates are making eye contact with you, they already walk into the midline, your coach is livid, and all of a sudden, you feel that knot in your stomach. This knot is the feeling of isolation, humiliation, and the feeling of exclusion. Normally, when we feel this way, we can take ourselves out of those situations and remove ourselves from those environments. But not as athletes, not in these situations, because we still have a game to play and 30 minutes to go. So now that we've set the scene, let's take a look at what you can do during a game to bounce back from a mistake like this. I believe that there are two tips that are key in helping you overcome that mistake and see the rest of the game out. The first is you must get back to the basics of the position. That means really executing the technique to its fullest potential and really being meticulous about it. Completing the basics is essential in kind of reversing that current state of mind that you have from a negative one into a positive one, and that's gonna help you build back your confidence. Next, you'll want to avoid chasing the game. You need to be patient and play what the game gives you. The last thing you wanna do is try something out of character and dig yourself into a deeper hole. And when it comes to both of these tips, it takes an enormous amount of discipline and patience. But I can assure you that, you know, from my own experiences, these two tips have really helped me get back on track and finish out the match. At the same time, too, slowly build my confidence back, which at the end of the day is the most important thing. (laughs) 
I believe that these two are linked because not chasing the game triggers getting back to the basics. And you know, after making a mistake, it can be difficult not to chase the game, mainly because our human instinct after losing anything precious to us, which in this case would be our confidence, is to do whatever we can to regain it as quickly as possible. And like I said in the previous podcast, when our play is influenced by emotion, it can sometimes lead to us losing all rationale and sense for the position. That's why sometimes when you see at the professional level, even at the youth level, when a goalkeeper makes a mistake, their mind can go to a dark place and begin to trigger something emotionally that can cloud their judgment and make them make mistakes back to back. And it makes it seem like they don't know how to play the position anymore when really it's just that emotion that's really hindering their full capability of thinking rationally and making sense of what's in front of them. So to make sure that that doesn't happen, we have to get back to the core principles of the technique as well as with our decision making. The technique side of things will help us get back to the basics, while honing in on our decision making will help us avoid chasing the game. And first, I wanted to dive into the technique aspect of this whole thing. When it comes to the technique, it's important that in these situations you double down on the mechanics. For example, if you're asked to deal with a one-touch back pass clearance or take a goal kick in the moments after your mistake, it's critical that you keep your head down and strike through the ball. As my goalkeeper coach used to always say, Omar, you can admire it when it's gone, but first you have to go through the technical progressions. And in these situations, that'll ensure that your body follows through and you clear a few heads in the process. And you guys may be thinking, okay, Omar, you know, how is this going to help me build my confidence back in moments like these? Well, you know, as crazy as it may sound, guys, something as simple as executing a routine technique can really kickstart the process of building your confidence back up and putting that air behind you. For example, if you guys watch basketball, you'll notice that when a three-point shooter misses multiple shots in a row, the coach will often draw up a play for them that will give them an easier look closer to the basket. And that's not to say that they're incapable of making a three-pointer. But because it's important for them to see the ball go in, you need to draw something up that's going to help them really execute the technique properly and build their rhythm back up slowly. This is going to build their confidence up little by little, which is exactly what is needed in this situation. Now, let's talk about what you can do to improve your decision making post mistake. And as that famous quote says, don't let your emotions make your decisions. And after these moments of a mistake, It can be tempting to go ahead and chase the game in an attempt to make that amazing save or crucial play that'll regain your own confidence as well as the trust from your teammates and your coach. But that emotion can oftentimes cloud your judgment and make you do something that's completely out of character, which is not what you want to do in a time like this. So, you know, maybe instead of running out of your goal 40 yards to make a sweeper keeper type play, you let your defenders take care of that and you show as an option for a back pass. You switch the field and we're on our way. Or maybe instead of catching a shot and immediately looking for a counterattack opportunity, you use that proper technique and that extra second to see the ball all the way into your hands. And it may not be glamorous, but remember, it's unnecessary to be flashy when you have little to no room for error. And you guys, at the end of the day, you've got to be willing to make that conscious decision to get back to the basics so that you don't chase the game. And this doesn't just happen naturally. It takes proactive preparation and trust within yourself. You need to hold on to that belief that there's going to be an organic way for you to make up for your error. And like we've seen in countless professional games, as well as I'm sure from our own experiences, there's going to be times where you make the mistake and then you go on to make three or four saves that keeps the score at 1-0 and all of a sudden your team scores a late equalizer and you guys tie 1-1. And at the end of the game, you won't be remembered for that mistake, but rather those string of amazing saves and kind of keeping yourself and your wits about you through those low moments of confidence that kept your team in the game and you guys go on and tie it. And in the best case scenario, you guys go on and win it. And any of those situations come with discipline and patience. They come with the understanding that regaining your confidence and the confidence of others is a process. And that process starts with these simple decisions. These decisions help create momentum and you need to use that momentum to get you back on track. All right, guys, so now that we've covered what to do in the game after you've just made a mistake, let's break down what you can do after it. And in my opinion, once the game is over, for me at least, it's important to let my raw emotions just take their toll. You don't want to be unrealistic with yourself and pretend like nothing happened and just push it off. That's only going to prolong the process of recovering your confidence. And trust me, guys, 
To make serious progress, you have to have closure, and the sooner you have it, the better. Once that's complete and you've had the time to process everything, I want you guys to reflect on the mistake. Play it back in your mind and use the mental imagery that uh, we discussed in episode 2. Once you have the play queued up in your head, I want you to dissect it step by step and try to understand if this mistake came from a lapse of concentration or was there a technical flaw that could be highlighted and worked on. And the reason why I'm asking you guys to decipher between these two specifically is because once you can identify which one it was, that'll dictate what your week of training should look like. The last thing you want to do is to overwhelm yourself because you can't figure out what caused the mistake. That digs into your confidence and then you begin to second guess yourself, which is not what we want in this process of recovery. This can oftentimes, you know, lead to you overtraining and end up creating more problems for yourself than actually fixing them. So like I stated in segment one, if it's a technical error, make sure to address it in that next week of training. If that means you have to take more flighted services so that you can address high balls and see that ball all the way into your hands, then so be it. Because confronting and then tackling the issue that caused the goal is and will always be what's going to kickstart the process of recovering your confidence. Because once your confidence is back, that fear is going to be lifted. And once that fear is lifted, you'll be back to making decisions based off of your instincts. Alright guys, so now that we've covered what to do during a game as well as what to do post-game, I wanted to discuss what can happen if your mistake or series of mistakes lead to you losing your starting job. And the biggest difference between this topic than the last two is that this one is out of your hands. Of course, you've made the mistakes, but you know, the first two, you can internalize those mistakes and you can use different tools and techniques to regain your confidence and change your perspective as well as the outlook to start regaining your confidence. But this scenario is a little bit different because the coach is making the decision and it's out of your hands. You really can't do anything other than say, okay, sounds good, coach. And so I kind of wanted to shed some light on this scenario um, by diving into a specific string of games from my own youth career that would forever change my life and my outlook on this topic specifically. Uh, You guys will kind of begin to understand when listening to this why I have such a connection to this topic and why I felt that it was so necessary to go in depth with this episode. So let me set the scene for you guys one more time. And the reason why I like to set the scene is because I feel like it gives you guys the full context of just the raw emotions and how I was feeling in that specific time of my life. Um, So I was 16 years old and it was the first year of the LA Galaxy Academy. And, you know, I had earned my starting spot on the team earlier in the year and was able to maintain it as we got closer to the academy playoffs. And in that year, you know, we were probably one of the best teams in the country, if not the best teams in the Western region. So there was a lot of hype on us to go into these playoffs and, you know, do some damage. And I was playing extremely well and felt really confident, you know, going into those final weeks of preparation. And on top of that, the coaches pulled me aside after one session and let me know that I was going to be traveling with a select group of the best 16s and 18s going to something called the Sum Cup. And what that Sum Cup was, was a tournament that was made up of all MLS academies. Uh, it was more of a showcase than anything, but you know there were still a lot of bragging rights on the table because that was like the first or second year that MLS teams had academy teams. So for us, you know that was a exciting time because we knew that a lot of college coaches and national team scouts were going to be there and for us being at that you know good age for college scouts and national team pools um, that was exciting news but we had to remember that the first thing we needed to take care of was our time in North Carolina and for those of you who are kind of unfamiliar with the academy system here in the states um, the way the playoffs work is that you play one preliminary round in one location which in that time was North Carolina And if you win your group outright, which means, you know, four teams in your group, and ideally you'd want to take nine points out of nine, uh, you move on to the Academy Finals in a second location, uh, which that year would be Los Angeles. So, you know, with us being the Galaxy, there was an extra amount of pressure and expectation uh, for us to win that group in North Carolina and then come home with a chance to win the tournament in front of our fans. So in the weeks leading up to the playoffs, things began to be way more professional. You know, we get to the field, uh, less joking, and just felt more of like a legit business trip for us. And our goalkeeper coach used to always be focused no matter what, but there was just something about him in those last few weeks that he kind of just made everything very professional for us, and the service was very, very good. Um, His communication with us was amazing. 
His lesson plans were, you know, drawn out really extensively. And it was just that last few weeks of fine tuning and getting us as sharp as we needed to be. And so, you know, fast forward to the actual travel day. We're getting on our flight to North Carolina. You know, I'm feeling ready to go. I have one eye in North Carolina and, you know, just kind of thinking ahead to Los Angeles, trying to think about what it would be like to play in front of our home fans and have everybody come out with the drums, the riot squad, all that stuff. So I'm already thinking about that. And I'm a little nervous to play our first game, but I'm just excited to see all that hard work, you know, come to fruition. So we get there. It's match day, and I remember getting up, going down to breakfast, and getting that last-minute pep talk from our goalkeeper coach, Matt Mennel. He didn't really put that much pressure on me in that sense, but he let us know, he let me and the other goalkeeper know, you know, what was on the line in that first game. He said that, you know, hey, get out there, make sure that you feel sharp and ready to go, but at the same time, we have to leave this field with a result. If we don't get any points from this game, and we go down with zero points after one, That's not good. If we can get one, great. But if we can get three, even better. And, you know, when he said that right away, something triggered in my mind to go, oh, God, okay, this is bigger than I thought it was going to be. Not on the line, a lot of high stakes, but high risk, high reward type situation. So I was excited because it made us feel like we were professionals. And that breakfast time, I still remember like we were walking down, everybody had their headphones on and we were all just feeling like, okay, this is some serious stuff and we want to be pros. So let's handle it like pros. So that was the exciting part for me. And, you know, we get on the bus, we get to the field, hot, sticky. It was very humid. Get off the bus, but then we see the fields. They have these billboards that are laid out across the the sidelines. And then you have uh, freshly cut grass, freshly painted fields. So again, it just felt like a professional environment. So I go through my warm up, get my last few touches there to kind of continue to build up my confidence, you know, finally put on my game shirt, shake the coach's hand, get onto the field and the game starts. In that first half, you know, I really didn't have much to do. I came out for a few crosses, uh, distributed the ball out of the back a few times, and just was able to keep things relatively simple, which to me was good because they got my feet wet a little bit in in the system right here and in the playoffs. So get to halftime, and all we're doing is, you know, getting some last-minute notes from our coaches and just talking tactics. Then the second half starts, and about 10 minutes in, they get this shot on target, and it was probably from like 25 yards out. And, you know, little did I know that this shot on target would kickstart a few things and the reason why I have this podcast going right now. Um, And, you know, that being said, this shot was not special at all. Uh, You know, 10 out of 10 times, that's a routine save. And one that your teammates, you know, turn their backs on you because they're already getting into their starting spots waiting for you to outlet the ball out of the back. But I don't know what happened in this specific scenario, but I, I dove, I took my eye off the ball. And before I knew it, the ball slipped out of my hands and they had their forwards who were waiting on top of the 18, again, like they're taught. And the ball trickles down to the right side of the six yard box. I get up, I step to the forward, he lays it back off and one of his buddies is coming from the 18, steps in, taps the ball into an empty net. Their team is celebrating. My teammates are looking at me like, dude, what the hell just happened? Like, are you serious? And I take that lonely walk and pick the ball out of the net. I look up, my teammates look defeated. I can already hear what my goalkeeper coach is going to say to me after the game. And, you know, my head is down, my shoulders are slouched, and I'm kind of at the point now where, hey, all that confidence that I was just talking about and boasting about is was gone, like completely gone. And I remember it being just this bizarre feeling, uh, mainly because personally I was never the kind of guy to make these high-profile mistakes. And if I made some mistakes, it was just little bad decisions you know, trying to play out of the back and kicking the ball out of bounds or losing the ball to the forward. But most of the time, it didn't turn into an actual goal. So I wasn't seen as that. And it was difficult for me to react to the situation because I had never been in it. And like I said earlier, it's about being proactive and getting your mindset right so that even if the scenario does occur, you have something to fall back on. But unfortunately, you know, I didn't. And on the biggest stage, I just made the most costly error. And I have no way of bouncing back really and unfortunately we concede one a few minutes later and this one wasn't my fault but now we're down two to zero and the game is just it's all but lost at that point we score one late but you guys in all honesty the game was over after my mistake my teammates looked defeated dejected they didn't even want to be there and again that attitude towards me and how they kind of just kind of walked away without making eye contact with me was was one of the toughest parts for me to take and after the game I remember walking off the field and my teammates really just avoiding me 
and no one came up to me and said, hey, Omar, you know, it happens. No one's trying to console me. No one really cares, honestly. I think they were just all pretty pissed. And again, I'm not naive. I know that that's something that can happen after a mistake like this, and especially in a big game like that. But, you know, I finally make it past all my teammates and get to my goalkeeper coach. And he tells me, hey, that's absolutely unacceptable. There's no excuse for that, Omar. So I was just like, okay, you know, I, I kind of expected that. But, hey, you know, my, my bad. And that's all, I, that's all I could really say at that point is just, hey, like, I'm sorry. Like, I mean, there's no <laughs> – I can't go back and change anything. But, look, I'm sorry. And, and hopefully next game I can actually come back and, and change your opinion to me and change the outcome of the game. And in those conversations that I had with my goalkeeper coach and my head coach, you know, those conversations started to feel more like I was a part of a business and it was less of a player to coach relationship. I mean, they had zero emotion and kept it as real as they possibly could with me. And like I said, at 16 years old, I understood the context and I understood that that was, you know, a byproduct of the situation that I just left myself in. But what really caught me off guard the most, guys, was how my teammates treated me. And I remember, you know, walking off the field and this was like something that's been ingrained in my head. I had one teammate, he's calling his parents and he's letting them know about the result. And he's on speaker and his parents say, hey, how'd it go? And when they asked him, he just said, well, we would have won, but Omar screwed us over. We need to start the other guy. And I remember this mainly because when he said my name, he went out of his way to raise his voice and make eye contact with me. And that was a gut check mainly because you know I'm really embarrassed but mainly because I'm buddy buddy with everybody you know I'm always the one making jokes I'm always the personality out there and all of a sudden this mistake turned me into somebody that these people didn't even want to hang out with or make eye contact with after the game let alone let alone even console me so again that is just to me it's just isolation and exclusion and it made me feel just something different that I've never felt before in my life So, you know, I was embarrassed and I really just tried to keep to myself. Even on the bus, I sat by myself as we got back to the hotel. I kind of, you know, sulked that night, thought about it, but I knew I had to move on because we had a game two days later. So the next day I wake up, I go to breakfast and my goalkeeper coach pulls me aside. And this time, you know, he's taking a different tone to me, I think, because everything was able to cool off. And um, he knew that in this situation, they needed me to be confident and ready to go for that next game. So he says, you know, hey, Omar, you know, what happened yesterday has happened to all of us. Don't worry about it. Keep your head up and let's win tomorrow. And fortunately, that conversation brought me back to reality and kind of calmed me back down. It was kind of like somebody extending a hand and bringing me back into the group. And my teammates at the times, too, really started warming up to me again. And, you know, things got back to normal. So I was really excited that I had that confidence or that mentality of inclusion and just excitement to go to that next game. You know, I'm not going to lie to you, after that first mistake, I was dreading playing another game. But again, after getting my team, my head coach, my goalkeeper coach, having those conversations with them, just kind of changed my perspective and outlook on things. And so that next game comes and the conversation within the team was, hey guys, you know, we need to get these three points because that's going to give us at least a fighting chance in that third match. So we get to the field and again, get through the warm up. Everything is good. Uh, goalkeeper coach my teammates everyone is uh, you know giving me these little words of confidence and I was excited getting back out there and playing and doing what I love to do without that fog over my head so first half goes by I make a few really good saves and we take the lead at halftime you know everyone is in high spirits after I made one or two saves some of my really good friends on the team you know they knew where I was where I was mentally and they started giving me uh, a lot of praise and like good job Omar you know good, uh, keep going let's keep doing this and at halftime you know a few high fives a few little words in my ear letting me know that I look good out there so slowly I'm just regaining the trust of my myself obviously and trust for my teammates and my coaches so in that halftime talk, they're telling us, you guys, we're up 1-0. We need to, ha- we need to get this win. Let's keep the shutout. Omar, keep doing what you're doing. And at the same time, guys, if we can get two or three more goals to bring our total up to three or four, we need to have the goals against average up and that goal difference so that if we do find ourselves in that you know, two-way or three-way tie at the end of the, the tournament, we can actually go through our group and progress. So we get those last-minute words from our coach. We head back out on the field. And the first 20 minutes is all us. We should have scored three or four more goals. And I think, you know, had we done that, things would have been a little bit different for me. But we don't. And as we all know how the game goes, sometimes if you don't take your chances, 
and you don't have much action, something bad can happen. So again, they get a shot from about 30 yards out. The guy hits it, and it's kind of like one of those shots that Rob Green took against the United States from Dempsey in the uh, 2010 World Cup. So it has a little bit of pace, but again, one of those saves that everybody's already moving up the field because they know you're going to easily take it as a routine front dive. And so he shoots it, but I don't go down to the ground with my body. I stick my hands down, and I keep my head up, and I'm already thinking about where is the next pass going. So he shoots it, hands stay down, my head is up, and boom, trickles right off my fingertips, and it rolls in. And again, guys, if I could tell you that this moment in time was probably the lowest point of my life, um, I'd still be understating it. It was, it was probably the lowest point I've ever felt as a player, as a person, because once again, the people that I love, my teammates, my coaches, they've just found new trust in me. And from this one mistake, again, I just eroded all that trust. It's gone. And so those last 15 minutes, they go by, the game ends, and we have one point from two games, and it's essentially because of me and my mistakes. I mean, there's no sugarcoating it. That's just, that's just how it was. And we hear the results from the other games and find out while we're still on the field, kind of, you know, picking up the pieces from this tie, that we're officially eliminated. And so I'm walking off the field, and again, started with my teammates. They wanted little to nothing to do with me. My coaching staff, uh, goalkeeper coach, they were past the point of even consoling me or even you know, saying anything to me to get my confidence back up because in their minds, it was kind of like, all right, what's the point? We've done it once and look what you know he rewarded us with. There I was, 16 years old, um, essentially just ostracized from this group in a sense. And the next day I was told that, hey, Omar, you, know, you didn't play so well, so we're going to give the last game to the backup goalkeeper. Uh, nothing negative. We just want to give him a chance to show because this last game doesn't mean anything. So we want him to play. In the next 48 hours, I started noticing how like every single player on the team started becoming buddy, buddy with the backup goalkeeper. They were making the same jokes that we used to make. And it was weird. Like it felt like a breakup guys. Like I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of the teammates of mine that I had were really good friends of mine, but Again, there's something that comes with being the number one and that kind of bravado that you take with you. And he definitely took it with him. And I remember him even telling me, like, this was the weirdest part. He was like, uh, hey, Omar, I, you know, it's kind of weird, but I just want to say thank you for making those mistakes and, you know, give me a chance to play. You know, I wasn't even supposed to play on this trip. So, like, thanks for, for doing that. And I was just like, all right, that was really rude. And that was kind of like, that was unnecessary and uncalled for. But again, that was kind of how far people were willing to go because I was a target at that time. Their jokes were very, like people would throw stuff at me like we were at breakfast, they'd throw like a banana or yogurt at me and they'd be like, all right guys, be careful, I might drop it. And so that's that was my reality now. You know, that was a new chapter in my life. I make these mistakes and all of a sudden, my close friends and teammates, they're treating me like I'm not even on the team. We go, we go to that game. Uh, I remember the backup goalkeeper does really, really well. And I started seeing how the coaches were treating him. They were treating him a little bit differently and they started really targeting more of the positive talk towards them. And when it came to me, it was more so of kind of like, we're just going to try to ignore you here and we're going to say the bare minimum to you. I remember after that, we packed up our stuff from North Carolina, coming home. The one thing that kept me kind of going and that saving grace was this idea that, okay, I didn't do well here, but we have the sum cup in a few days or excuse me, in a few weeks. So I think I can get my confidence back there and that's going to be the other opportunity that I have to gain this trust back of my teammates. But we're on the flight home and I remember my goalkeeper coach coming down the aisle and he just says, hey Omar, you know, um, so for the Sum Cup group, things have changed a little bit. We're not going to be bringing you with us. Um, We just don't feel like, you know, when you're recent performances, you're in the physical and mental state to perform well in this. So we're going to take the backup goalkeeper. He did well last game and we feel like he's going to give us the best chance to win. So, you know, sorry about that. We'll see you in a few weeks. Uh, The team is going to be training and doing their own thing, but um, we'll just see you in a few weeks. Okay. And there I was on this flight home to North Carolina, six hours of having to process all this. We're eliminated from the playoffs. I'm cut from the Sum Cup group and essentially just isolated and cut out from my own team. And that humbled me, guys. You know, it it, it taught me a valuable lesson that nothing in life is guaranteed. Even if someone tells you something, you still have to have consistent performances 
and show well from week to week for them to make good on their promise. And based on my recent performances, I just flat out wasn't good enough. And I paid the price for that. So as you guys can imagine, those next few months were extremely tough for me, both mentally and physically. Um, I come back to the team and from the first session, it's pretty clear who the number one is now. You know, how the coaches are treating him, how the players are treating him, and pretty much not giving me much attention at that point. You know, I stopped getting the same reps. I was always with the second group and the distance between me and my coaches was really tangible. Like you can you can tell that they were either avoiding me or they just wanted to do again the bare minimum conversation with me. And this was, you know, the the reality for me now. This was the new chapter in my life and in my career. I went from being the starter and that big personality of the group to the number 2 and essentially an outsider all because of two games and two mistakes. And at that very moment, it was kind of a flight or flight. I had to make a decision. Was I going to cave in and let these mistakes define who I was as a person and as a goalkeeper? Or was I going to fight back and do whatever I could to prove to my coaches and my teammates that those mistakes, those playoffs were just a fluke? And I was fortunate enough, guys, to have really good people in my corner at the time who had been through similar adversity, You know, whether it was my uncle, uh, my grandparents, my parents. Uh, my other good friends who weren't on the team, they really helped me see things, you know, as a glass, you know, half full, not half empty. You know, they urged me to keep pushing and to keep fighting. But at the end of the day, that I had to be patient. And that was the key word here. And that's the key word that if you guys walk away from this podcast episode with anything, patience is absolutely key in a process like this. They made me realize that, you know, regaining the trust of anyone isn't just a one day or a one week thing where, you do it for a week, you do really well, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, you know, extend your hand out and you want, you know, want that trust back from them. That's just not the reality. In reality, it's a long and it's a grueling process. And you must be willing to prove to them that you're capable of that change. And that change right there, it comes from that patience and performing on a consistent basis to really complete that process of recovering your own confidence as well as recovering their trust and yeah. confidence in you. All right, guys, so to finish up this episode, I wanted to bring everything you guys have heard so far full circle. Uh, it'll help you guys understand why I've chosen to lay out the tips that I have and how those tips work for me in my attempt to regain the trust of my teammates, as well as the trust in myself and my abilities as a goalkeeper. So in those next two months, I first had to face my mistakes. I needed to revisit them and see if they were technical errors, lapses of concentration, or both. And meeting these mistakes head on would give me clarity, and that clarity would help me remove my emotions from the equation. Like we said earlier in the episode, guys, whenever you have emotions and you're trying to make a decision, those emotions can sometimes make you think irrationally and really cloud your judgment and fog your decision making. So I first needed to remove that from the equation so that I could think rationally. And once I did, I understood that my mistakes were technical errors and that they could have easily been prevented. Had I just maintained eye contact with both shots and gone through the technical progressions like I had done my entire life, I would have been able to save both of them. So I took that information and for the next two months, I began to implement it. I got back to the technique and to the mechanics that were crucial to the position and that were crucial for me to start rebuilding my confidence and gain the trust back in myself. Next, I truly had to recognize that all this was a process. And what I mean by that is, when I went to training, I couldn't chase the game. I couldn't regain my confidence or win back their trust after one big save or one good training session. I needed to quietly go about my business and perform on a week-to-week -week basis. You know, this mindset was huge for me because it allowed me to play without any expectations on myself, but rather just putting my head down, going to work, and trusting that it'll all work out. And I feel like whenever you have expectations, guys, you're due to be disappointed. Sometimes it won't meet your expectations, and you'll sit there and go, okay, like, what did I get all excited about if that's not the result that I got? And in these scenarios specifically, having those expectations will disappoint you because if you say, hey, I want to be the starter again within two months, and if I'm not the starter, then okay, like, what's going to happen then, you know? You want to make sure that you set realistic expectations for yourself because that will allow you to slowly regain your confidence and trust that process that we're talking about. And lastly, you know, to begin to rebuild my self-image and my self-worth, I had to create a foundation of confidence. A foundation that could withstand situations like the one I found myself in. You know, I tried to embody the saying, don't get too high on the highs or too low on the lows. 
I needed to make sure that I never became complacent or content with good performances. That complacency could lead to a lapse of attention to details, which could put me back to square one and like I was in North Carolina. I also couldn't get too low on the lows. If I did, that would leave me vulnerable again, and that could send me back again to where I started. Instead, the idea was that I should have so much confidence in my abilities that even if I were to concede a goal from a mistake, I could bounce back and lean on that foundation of confidence to weather the storm. And after all this, guys, you know, I'm happy to say that I was able to bounce back from my mistakes and regain my starting job with the team later in the season. It took me time, but to be honest with you, there wasn't a specific timeline or anything like that. I just controlled what I could control and set realistic expectations that I could meet. And that was the important thing. Something as simple as executing a simple task on a day-to-day basis really has a way of adding up into something great. And again, that's the process of rebuilding your confidence. And that's where I want to end this episode. If you take anything away from this, remember that bouncing back from any adversity takes both a plan as well as patience. You need to be willing to go through a grueling process, and within that process, be willing to take everything in stride. Not everything someone says to you guys is negative, or everything you're thinking about is negative. You need to find a way to flip all the stuff that's coming at you and take it in stride. Whether it's, you know, comments from your coaches or you needing to look in the mirror and be realistic with yourself, you need to be able to take all that with you and use it as constructive criticism because the goal should be to progress, not regress. And if you're currently going through this process, I hope that these tips have helped you gain some clarity that it's not the end of the world. You still have more left in you. You just need to find it. And that comes with a plan. And if you're someone that isn't currently going through something like this, check to see where your foundation of confidence currently lies. Because you want to be proactive versus reactive. Because being proactive will put you in the best position possible to be able to bounce back and recover from a mistake, both in-game, post-game, and if you're in a battle to win back your starting job. All right, guys. So thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the ProGK Podcast. I really do appreciate everybody who's been sending me feedbacks and comments about the episodes, whether that's Instagram DMs, emails, or if I see you on the field. Uh, it really means a lot to me, and it keeps me going with these episodes, uh, mainly because you know I was a young goalkeeper growing up and wanted as much information as I could possibly find out there. And I wanted to use that information to interpret it and figure out a way for it to help me in my day-to-day routine, as well as just building good habits as I was growing up. And with any information that I could potentially pass on to you guys and, you know, give you as much as I've been taught or from learning from other coaches or learning from other goalkeepers as well, just pass that off to you guys. And hopefully you guys can also internalize it and then interpret it in a way that's going to help you guys out and grow as a goalkeeper. And again, guys, my name is Omar Zini. I appreciate you guys tuning into this episode. We'll be back with another one next week. Have a good one. Take care. Yeah. Grandmaster Soul, shouts. Let's get it. You deal with the best, steam when I flex, S on my chest, no love for us. I'll take the bet, love for the check, 40 on deck, must it and catch up, cause we got the rest, eating so good, look at this food, saying the truth, ain't being rude, you stick like cheese.